Jeffrey, we have got Caden Proctor going to Iowa. I believe this is the only transfer portal pickup, uh, at least the only one that I'm aware of uh, going on for Iowa right now. And then, of course, the Iowa offensive coordinator job is still open. Uh, rumors were circulating that Paul Chris was a candidate for a while. He has not taken the job. Uh, Joe Philbin was also a candidate for a while. He is a uh, quality assistant or something like that over Ohio state. Uh, but he has also not taken the job. So I don't know if we're counting those guys out yet, but they don't seem to be rushing to take the job. Uh, Jeffrey, why don't you go ahead and just start on uh Caden uh, Proctor a little bit. What does he bring to this Iowa offensive line? Brings about six foot, seven inches and 360 pounds. Uh, so that's a good place to start. Um, you know, I think the, what I typically take for the approach with recruits is, okay, let's, you know, we get the commitment first. Great. Uh, let's get it. The actual, let's get him signed first. Right now let's get him in on the campus. Let's see if he's actually good. Let's see if he can stay healthy. Like this is typically my stance. I, I just, it's hard for me to get super excited for recruits until I see it. Okay. It is a little bit different with Proctor because he's got a whole year under his belt at Alabama in the SEC. He struggled at first for sure, but I have read into how much improvement he showed throughout the year uh, last year. And then especially the last four or five games of the year, he really did well. Okay. So it is, it is a safer bet that when he arrives on campus, he will be a very good left tackle. So that it doesn't just help left tackle. It, it really should help almost the entire line, at least two or three spots, because now we've got a tackle that should be playing guard, playing guard, or our left tackle switching over to right tackle and then him kicking down to guard. It essentially picks up one or two spots, maybe even three on the offensive line to solidify it. So um, I believe that uh, along with better schemes uh, to help out the offensive line so that they're not getting attacked when seemingly the defenses have a pretty good idea on what the plays are that are coming up. Uh, so you switch things up with scheme. Suddenly you've got a twofold reason why the offensive line for Iowa should look better next year. Well, you start talking about scheme. Do you want to hit on the offensive coordinator real fast? Your thoughts on Chris Philbin and who the possible uh, new guy coming in is? Yeah, so like I said, I, I think I know who it is. Uh, I'm going to probably shy away from naming it right now. I'll just do some really stupid hints at it. But I did think it was Joe Philbin at one point. Um, and then I, it, I, you know, all signs pointed to Paul Christ. We will see some days. Someday if some of the details with that are let out on why that went down, it wasn't just as simple as Paul Christ turned it down. He turned it down officially is how I think it went, but there was just a lot of things kind of uh, happening behind the scenes there. Um, so the next guy is going to be somebody that's going to check the marks. I, I believe the next guy is going to be somebody that will check the marks that I wanted, which is young-ish guy, okay? Um, a col Somebody from the college ranks and somebody that has a lot of experience with college quarterbacks. So if it is the guy that I believe it is, he will, he will check those boxes and he has power, tons of power five experience. So um, not in the big 10 to give another hint, but if, if that, that Bill O'Brien, um, we will, we will see if, if this guy, if, if it is him, if, if Justin gives him the uh, quarterback guru stamp of approval, um, I can guarantee you he's more of a quarterback guru than Brian Ference was, um, although a great offensive line coach, Brian Ferentz. Um, um, so I, I believe the schemes will, you know, I, I, I get nervous with making outlandish statements when it comes to the Iowa offense. I, I, I shockingly was hoping for the 99th ranked offense going into last year. How foolish that, you know, the thought process was, but, but it, it, it should look different. Okay. There is going to be different schemes. For the most part, the the blocking schemes for 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 running the ball downhill were mostly fine. We switched from a lot of zone to a lot of pin and pull last year, and we saw a lot of success with that. But it's only it's going to be limited with the schemes and quarterback that we were rolling out there for the throw game. I think we will see you know an improvement on both sides or on, on both quarterback and play calling with that. 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, the offensive coordinator position under Kirk Ferentz is a special one because Kirk Ferentz obviously has his way that he wants his team to be run, which has worked out for him. Uh, he's, you know, he's the longest tenured FBS coach, I think, um, active right now. So obviously he's been doing something right there. Um, and <clears throat> it's not always a sexy offense. It's not always something that, you know, is going to drop your, your mouth, but guess what? He made it to the Big Ten Championship last game, last year. I mean, the guy wins games and he has a formula to do it. Um, and sometimes you just have to think, you know, if Kirk Ferentz is taking a while on this, he's obviously doing his homework, making sure not only he finds a good offensive mind, but one that is willing to work with him and uh, make the right decisions. We have a comment here from Jim. He has a guest, Kevin Johns, formerly from Duke will likely be the new OC he believes. So I don't I, I swear that. Jim doesn't have a doesn't have a job. Um but this this <laughs> is the offensive coordinator this is the offensive coordinator that I was alluding to just now. So wow. Wow Jim. Good guess there. So if that mm-hmm. is Jim, we'll give you a uh, proper credit there, man. That's that's a great guess. Uh, and Jeffrey sees for, for the record, I've known this I've known this since this weekend, but I've I've had to sit on it because because you you protect sources, uh, but it, it is not official. But that is the definite leader in the in the clubhouse right now. Of course, yeah, I've had people tell me information before too, and you never want to put those people's names out there because if they're wrong, <laughs> then everybody goes at them. Yeah. Um, Justin, we we talked a lot about Caden Proctor and the offensive coordinator position stuff like that. What are your uh, overarching thoughts on Proctor and the uh, offensive coordinator that could come in? Yeah, um, I, I'll start with Proctor. Um, you know, Jeffrey is more in tune with uh, the the OC stuff than I am, so I'll let him uh, kind of give his stamp on that. But uh, with, with Caden Proctor, you know, um, it was one of those things where it, it's a weird situation where he was recruited by Iowa, and then you know, kind of the the fans kind of turned on him, and then you know he's he's coming back, so. Like like Jeffrey talked about, he's a he's a mountain of a human being. That is the first thing you notice about him is just just a huge huge uh, guy, um, a first round you know level talent. And um, to Jeffrey's point, you know, looking over his PFF grades, he he did you know play his best in the biggest moments. Um, his overall grade sixty six point three, a better run blocker than he is a pass blocker, which will probably serve him you know serve him well there. But, you know, he he developed his pass blocking, especially over the course of the season. His best game, believe it or not, was against Georgia in the SEC title game. Where he had a, you know, his overall grade normally is a 66.3, um, and his pass block grade is a 58. But against Georgia, 78.4 overall, 74.6 run block, 79.2 pass block. Actually, pass block much better in that game. And uh, his best games were against Georgia, LSU, Tennessee, and Michigan was actually his fifth best game. And in and, and a game where the offensive line there didn't – performed very well and that was his fifth best game and it was a solid game by him overall um so you know i you know caden proctor just fits you know the type of five-star recruit i see iowa getting you know this big offensive lineman to come in and just kind of set the tone in the battle of the trenches and yeah it's going to be it's going to be a massive get for them and um yeah i i think you know over the course of his development in the in the middle of the season and it's it's the thing is about offensive linemen is you know they don't develop extremely quickly, so to see that over the course of the season was was actually really impressive, and and um, I think he'll take a big leap between uh, last year and and this coming year in Iowa. So, yeah, I mean, you yeah, if see... I can, re- go ahead, yeah, if I can to to just add on to what Justin said there, I think at one point Brian Bulaga was the only starting left tackle as a true freshman at Iowa ever. Um, that's somewhat recent, you know, I mean, that's like, like 10, 12 years ago, something like that. Like that, to, the point I'm trying to make is it's rare, right. For a left yeah, tackle to start as a true freshman. Um, so him to go down there to, to, to Alabama, which obviously, you know, has been the, the, the career out for college football very quickly start and, and they stuck with them, you know, and maybe yeah. part of that was because the Alabama, the Alabama offensive line need, needed him to be there. It, it had kind of gotten beat up a little bit towards the end there. But I do think that that you know said heavily that they believed in the talent, and then it showed out by the end of the year because it's it, you you brought up a great point. It's tough. That is a tough position for young guys because it is so technical. I mean, it is yeah. so technical. Hand placement, feet, 
everything like that. Like it is, it is drilled over and over. This is me looking from practice. I never played offensive line to be clear. Um, yeah. But so th- th- you're bringing up excellent points and it, it, he seemed to get a lot better, you know, plug and play. I always get nervous saying that, but he's about as close to plug and play for, for Iowa as you can get. Agreed. Yeah. And I mean, uh, whenever you go into the SEC and do literally one of the most difficult things in college football, which in my mind is to start at tackle as a true freshman, you know, I mean, like you said, there are just so many things that go into playing offensive line and, um, you know, not just, you know, having the technique and stuff like that, but having the feel for it and the speed at which guys are going. And uh, I, I just look at it and I say, in Ohio State wanted the guy. And I say, you know, if he went to Ohio State, he would have been the most impactful guy to go in to that uh, transfer transfer class for me because, I mean, this is a guy with experience that uh, if you get a good left tackle, that can change your offensive line. You don't have to help as sure. much with him. You don't have to chip block and do those, do those some kind of things. You know, you can leave a guy out there on an island. And it's almost as invaluable as a cornerback who you can leave out on an island consistently, uh, especially with some of the best wide receivers out there as well. So, um, and I like the point you made, Justin. He, he did struggle a little bit more in pass blocking than he did run blocking. And one of the reasons he's a really good run blocker is because, man, he, he is a big boy. Uh, you know, what would you say, Jeffrey? 360, 350 or something like that? I mean, seven. Big bag. Yep. yeah, yeah, big guy. And he'll, he'll really be able to help out in that area. Justin, did you, did you have any thoughts on who Iowa should be looking for in their offensive coordinator and Kirk Ferentz hiring one or anything like that before you move mm-hmm. on? Not nothing crazy. You know, I was just kind of like listening to some speculation on and and some of the NFL guys, it just doesn't seem like it's going to be any of those. Uh, some of the NFL names I'd heard Brian Johnson, Frank Reich, Pete Carmichael. So, um, but you know, don't, don't necessarily, uh, I was just kind of like, kind of, uh, listen to some Iowa content, put, getting the feelers out and see what, what kind of they were saying, but you know, not a ton of knowledge inside of it. Um, but very, very interested to see because naturally it's going to, uh, going to affect us in uh in many ways so and you know it's it's not official yet with the offensive coordinator there's just kind of a leader in the house type yeah. of deal um and then you know i'd be remiss if i didn't bring up you know phil parker defensive coordinator lavar woods special teams coach these are the reasons why iowa has had success you know the last yep. two three years um and when you and uh jer when you asked me earlier about you know, lack of transfer portal activity. Certainly uh, not having the offensive coordinator is going to limit your ability to bring in offensive players, okay? I mean, I think Caden Proctor was a little bit special with that. Maybe he had a little bit of knowledge uh, on the offensive coordinator, who knows? But um, the the what the NIL has already morphed into doing now, just a couple years into this thing, is retention, <laughs> of of players coming back that was what the Iowa coaches and Tyler Barnes did a great job with along with Caden Proctor what was focusing on bringing guys back and we don't have the entire defense back because unfortunately Cooper DeGene is going to take that NFL bag a little bit too enticing for him but outside of that uh all-american you know linebacker mo- almost our entire D-line except for one guy that was a super senior so those guys got recruited back onto the roster to a defense that was extremely good last year. So that was what the focus was. Now you hopefully get the quarter or uh, uh, offensive coordinator into place. And wow, what would this look like if Iowa's defense and special teams looked a lot like it did? It has the last five years, but we actually have a confident offense. Color me excited that we might actually get to start figuring that out here next year. Maybe one day. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Justin. Go no, ahead. I was going to say maybe one day you can bring in a five-star quarterback. I can say <laughs> that now. I, I can only. I, I had to wait until this season to say that. I'm just right. kidding. Y'all, beat this. y'all be this. Uh-huh. You got bragging. So, that's a, go ahead, Jared. No, I was just going to say. Um, you know, one of the biggest things is is Cade McNamara coming back. I mean, you know, give all, give all the credit in the world to Deacon Hill coming in and and doing yeah. what he did. You know, obviously he won a good amount of games when he was a starter. But um, Cade McNamara, I mean, he's the type of guy that you want at Iowa. You know, doesn't turn the ball over a lot. He's not going to try and make you know a bunch of super special plays because he's going to understand that you know this is a defensive led team. This is a special teams led team. And uh, you know, as long as they bring in an offensive coordinator who 
is going to make sure that the offense does their job, doesn't turn the ball over too much, and is able to run the ball. That I mean, that's the most important thing. And so if Kirk Ferentz can get this offensive coordinator higher right, um, Iowa, I will be choosing them to finish over USC in the Big Ten because I, I firmly believe that Iowa is a better football program, has better coaching all around uh, on their on their team than you know USC does. Um, I think USC has a lot of hype and you know good for them, but uh, they're also going to be in for a bit of a rude awakening when they come to the Big Ten because all these teams want to talk about oh Big Ten West whatever else, but we'll see. Uh, it, we'll see. when you get knocked into it, it's a uh, it's a uh, and, and as a as a side note to that, I heard that all but one guy in the, in Washington's entire two deep offense is not on the roster starting this spring. Oh my gosh! They've That's either crazy. graduated NIL. I mean, new coach, new everybody at Washington. I don't have a ton of faith in UCLA. So looking at you, Oregon. Listen, that transition. Scott Frost came over from the Pac-12 and said the Big Ten was going to have to adjust to him. And, uh, you know, we saw Michigan, Washington, the top of the top from each play out. And so, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a rude awakening for, I think, a lot of these Pac-12 teams coming over. I, I agree. In the Big Ten Huddle, please do like and subscribe. We appreciate that. If this was your first time listening, we are the Big Ten Huddle. We cover all things Big Ten football and basketball. We have a long episode every Sunday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, all at 9 o'clock. So come in, check us out, get in the chat, let us know what you're thinking. We would love to have you join us and learn more about the Big Ten.